Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at the themes of war and peace, and I suppose I should also say justice, in Deuteronomy chapters 19 through 21, in our continuing study of the book of Deuteronomy. Now, this central section, you know, started off uh, with the stipulations in, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, where we had the Ten Commandments. Uh, when we got to chapters 12 through 15, we had those commandments that are related to the first four commandments, commandments related to God. So there were warnings about adultery, uh, idolatry and uh, laws about how you worship. Uh, we get to chapter 16, verse 18, and from here on, uh, these commandments and stipulations are related to the last six commandments, how to, how to get along with other people. So we had things like qualifications for leadership, and of course that relates to uh, respect for authority, honor your father and mother. Uh, now we have war and peace, but I want, also want to add justice. I just couldn't fit it in here. Uh, and then there's going to be laws of living. Uh, so that those that first section dealt with ceremonial righteousness, our righteousness toward God. Then we have governmental righteousness, getting along with others and those in authority. And finally, we're going to see eventually uh, practical righteousness, just you know, again, getting along with your next door neighbor. Deuteronomy chapter 19 uh, begins with the establishment of cities of refuge. That is, if you did something that resulted in hurting or, more importantly, killing someone, uh, and it wasn't a premeditated sort of thing, you weren't out to get that person, but maybe it was an accident, uh, maybe you were a bit culpable, but again, you, you didn't intend to go out and kill someone, uh, you could run to a city of refuge and until the, you know, maybe, maybe tempers could die down or, or uh, it could be tried uh, by the judges. And here you would find refuge. Uh, three cities were on the east side of the Jordan, three cities on the west side of the Jordan. Uh, and scattered throughout the land, these cities of refuge where you could find refuge uh, against vengeance that, that would be taken otherwise. Next we have, and that's related to this, uh, these cities of refuge, laws about unintentional manslaughter. You'd, again, you do something and it results in the death of someone, but that wasn't your intention. Next we have, in contrast to that, uh, laws against premeditated murder, where, where all bets are off. If you plan to go out and kill someone, then you're forfeiting your life, and the penalty for that was death. Uh, next, we uh, move from that to boundary markers. You can see, you know, cities of refuge sort of set boundaries, um, but uh, they, these were to be uh, inviolate, where you, you know, if somebody had a, a boundary marker and somebody came along and moved that, um, well, that was, that was tantamount to stealing from that person. Um, and then finally, we have laws of witness. Think about it. A, a boundary marker is a witness, and then uh, laws of witness, uh, remember, you weren't allowed to be a false witness. Now, we, we read in Deuteronomy 19.15 that a single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which is committed on the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. And this brings up the question, why two or three? W you know, what's wrong with one witness? You know, maybe only one person saw it. Uh, which means several things. First of all, it means there might be times where a guilty person goes free, but that's better than bringing an unjust accusation and unjust condemnation and judgment against an innocent party. And so, if there was only one witness, well, he, he might, have been, might have been mistaken. He is to, there is to be cooperative evidence. Um, there must be more than one witness against someone. Even at the trial of Jesus, remember, there were, of course, there were false witnesses, but there were two witnesses who, who wanted to come forward. And, of course, uh, as they were questioned, it soon became apparent that they didn't have their stories together. <laughs> and so Jesus should have gone free as a result. Deuteronomy 19.16, if a malicious witness rises up against a man to accuse him of wrongdoing, then both the men who have the dispute shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who will be in office in those days. Um, and so, it, it get, notice it gets kicked up to the, high, to the higher court. It goes now before a priest or a judge. 
verse 18, the judges shall investigate thoroughly, and if the witness is a false witness, and he has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him just as he had intended to do to his brother. Thus you shall purge the evil from among you. Being a false witness could be a dangerous, dangerous affair, where you would suffer the penalty that you tried to impose on somebody else. Verse 21, Thus you shall not show pity, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. And of course, we have to ask, how does this relate to the commandment of Jesus to turn the other cheek? That's, very, that's the opposite, the polar opposite of life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and so on. And the answer is that one is the governmental authority, the other is the personal preference. That is, uh, I am not to, to go out and say, I want justice. I'm, I need to be able to forgive. When I am wronged, I need to be able to forgive, but I can't forgive on behalf of someone else. In other words, um, if if person A punches B in the nose, I can't say, oh, I'm going to forgive that punch because I'm not the one that got punched. I can only forgive for myself. Deuteronomy chapter 20, now we move to the area of warfare, and in verses uh, 1 through 4, we have uh, the, the call to be trusting God in times of war. Verses uh, 5 through 9 are military exemptions. There are certain people who did not have to go to war, and we're going to see a, a list there. Uh, the military exemptions are those to the man, are given to the man who's built a new house, and he hasn't dedicated it. Uh, he hasn't gotten a chance to, you know, to enjoy his house. Uh, he's planted a vineyard and hasn't begun to enjoy its fruit. He's engaged to a woman, has not begun to enjoy her. He has not married her yet. Um, and, or even someone who is afraid or faint-hearted was given a military exemption. Verse 10, now we have terms of peace. Notice we went from war to peace. Uh, to those who surrender, they were, all, they, you know, now we're not talking about those who were living in the land. They were in the, under the judgment of God. But for other countries, if they, if they surrendered, then terms of peace were to be given. Uh, but those who were living in the land, they were to be completely destroyed because that was God's judgment. And that was inviolate. Verse 16, only in the cities of these people that the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance, you shall not leave alive anything that breathes. Um, there was a cancer in the land, and it was to be ruthlessly cut out. Verse 17, but you shall utterly destroy them, the Hittite, and the Amorite, the Canaanite, and the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, as the Lord your God has commanded you, so that they may not teach you to do according to all their detestable things, which they have done for their gods, so that you would sin against the Lord your God. That cancer was to be removed. Harsh? Yes, absolutely. It was to be removed so that it would not infect the rest of the nation and the rest of the world. And that speaks to the seriousness with which God takes sin. So we have the complete destruction of those living in the land. And finally, uh, verses 19 20 almost uh, uh, just, just seems uh, almost like a subject change, but it's not really. The preservation of, of fruit trees. We're talking about those things that are moved out of the land, and yet the fruit trees are allowed to remain. So we have rules of warfare, chapter 20, but then we have rules of other sorts of killings, uh, which takes place in chapter 21. Now in chapter 21, verse 1, if a slain person is found lying in the open country, in the land which the Lord your God gives you to possess, and it is not known who has struck him, then your elders and your judges shall go out and measure the distance to the cities which are on the slain one. Here, here's somebody... Uh, he died. It was evidently not a natural death. You know, somebody struck him, and it's not known who did it. Verse 3, It shall be that the city which is nearest to the slain man, that is, the elders of that city, shall take a heifer of the herd, 
which has not been worked, which has not pulled a yoke. Um, that that is a brand, you know, he's this as heifer is hot off the lot, as it were. And the elders of that city shall bring the heifer down to a valley with running water, which has not been plowed or sown, and shall break the heifer's neck there in the valley. It's a sacrifice that's made. Verse 5, Then the priests, the sons of Levi, shall come near, for the Lord your God has chosen them to serve him and to bless in the name of the Lord, and every dispute and every assault shall be settled by them. So they're coming. Um, they can't pass judgment because they don't know who did it. And so an animal is sacrificed on behalf of that one who maybe committed a crime. Verses 6 and 7, All the elders of that city, which is nearest to the slain man, shall wash their hands over the heifer, whose neck was broken in the valley, and they shall answer and say, Our hands did not shed this blood, nor did our, our eyes see it. They're saying, We're innocent of that blood. And so they, they pray a prayer. Forgive your people, Israel, whom you have redeemed, O Lord, and do not place the guilt of innocent blood in the midst of your people, Israel, and the blood guiltiness shall be forgiven them. So you shall remove the guilt of innocent blood from your midst when you do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. Now, that reminds us of an instance when Jesus was brought on trial. And Pilate went and washed his hands, saying, I'm innocent of that blood. I'm going to release him. And the, the crowd cried out, No, don't do that. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd, saying, I'm an innocent of this man's blood. See to that yourselves. And they, and they cry out, and all the people said, His blood shall be on us and on our children. Striking words, and within 40 years, that was being carried out in a very vivid, literal, and graphic way, as the people of Jerusalem were slain and butchered by the Romans in, when, the, when the city fell in, in the year 70. Of course, that's not the end of the story. Because for us, we hear those words, and there's a sense in which Jesus came so that his blood would be upon us. Not in the sense of bringing us guilt, because frankly we have been guilty, but in the sense of dying in our place, so that his blood is treated as though we had yes been guilty, but now had been convicted and slain and put to death. He died the death that I am spiritually and figuratively assumed to have died. He took my place, identifying with me, so that my punishment has been carried out in Christ, if we believe.